mode. Hello and good day. My name is Buddy Crescioni. I'm currently the America's Aerospace Quality System Committee Chair and the America's Requirements Leader for Projects and 9100 here in the Americas. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and spend the next hour going through the key changes to the 9100 standard. Uh, right now, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, your line is muted, so you cannot ask questions. But what I would encourage you to do is if you look at the web, go to webinar control panel on the right-hand side, you'll see a spot for questions. If you submit your questions, uh, they will be forwarded to me. I will answer them, and then we will send out notification to all those who are on this particular webinar. If you're interested in this, these slides, uh, there are two places you can get the slides. At the very end of the presentation, I will show you uh, how to go access the slides from the IAQG website. Also, they will be posted on the Perry Johnson website and within 24 hours. All right, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. So what I'd like to cover today first is kind of a brief introduction, I'll talk about uh, the revision process, talk about how the, the principles are changing, talk about then some of the key changes within ISO 9001. Of course, 9100 is based upon ISO 9001. So uh, I'd like to cover some of the changes in that document, then talk specifically about the aviation space and defense changes within the 9100. Then I'll talk a little bit about a kind of a high-level summary, talk about transition with key dates, and then, as I said, we'll talk about deployment support material, where to find it. Uh, the IEQG 9100 team uh, has developed numerous deployment support materials to be able to aid users uh, in their transition activity. So introduction. Just want to remind everybody uh, that the 9100 is based upon ISO 9001. ISO 9001, tremendous quality management system standard. Uh, I think it's about 1.2 million companies worldwide are currently certified to ISO 9001. So it is a good basis for the 9100. Also, uh, Within aviation, space, and defense, few of our suppliers, especially as you go deep in the supply chain, are 100% aviation, space, or defense. So therefore, they have customer requirements for ISO 9001. So we want to make sure that we're not, the aviation, space, and defense industry is not levying a whole new set of requirements. We want to leverage, here's what uh, you would go need for some of your customers within an ISO 9001, and then we build upon that for 9100, adding additional requirements specific for our particular industry. And the thinking there is that if we can flow down similar types of requirements from an industry perspective, then that minimizes company-specific information or requirements that you would then as a supplier need to go comply with. So why is ISO 9001 need to change? Uh, if you think about it, uh, ISO 9001 has really not changed since the year 2000. Uh, at that point, we went from the 20 clauses to the process approach. Uh, there was a change in 2008, but if you remember right, it was an amendment. Uh, so it really wasn't a full, a full change. Uh, it was just kind of a little bit of a minor tweak. And obviously, how things have progressed in the last 15, 16 years is quite significant. Uh, there's still the focus within the standard about satisfying customers, customer satisfaction, process approach. What we're hoping is, is that the ISO 9001 2015 provides a consistent foundation for the future. What we're hoping is, is that this structure that we'll go over this morning or today uh, is consistent uh, moving into the future, so it'll be good for another 15 years. The environments we operate in today 
are quite different than they were 15, 16 years ago. Much more multinational cooperation, much more businesses. Uh, we have partnerships than what was done in the past. So we need to make sure that our standards stay relevant to those new world conditions. Also, we want to make sure that the ISO standard as well as 9100 meets the needs of all our interested parties. Uh, ISO did an extensive amount of work uh, to go ask users for input, just like 9100 did. Uh, I think we asked our survey back in the 2012 time frame asking people, what do you think about the published standard and what do you want to see in the next version of the standard? Finally, integration with other management systems. You may have heard about Annex SL. Annex SL uh, sets the standard structure for all ISO management system standards. That way when companies need to integrate their quality, environmental, information technology, and so forth, it'll be easier because all the standards are based upon a similar structure and similar language. So what does 9100 need to change? As I said, of course, we're based upon ISO 9001. So therefore, when ISO 9001 changes, so does 9100. I mentioned about the uh, survey that was done. Uh, we actually kicked off the 9100 team, this last revision, in 2012. You see the web survey was actually done in 2013. And also, uh, we get numerous clarifications uh, with regard to the standard. If there's questions, uh, in the past people used to just send the sector document representative an email. Today you can go do that through OASIS. And what we do is we look at those clarifications to say, how can we go make the standard more clear in the future? Uh, of course, the concern there is that if you try to solve one problem, you might create a whole different set of problems with the clarifications. There needs to be some caution uh, by just making changes. So who writes the standards? Uh, here's the team. Uh, you can see the Americas team there in green. Uh, yellow is the, the European team, the blue Asia Pacific, and across the bottom you'll notice other standards. Uh, with those other standards, um, we wanted to make sure that as we progressed in the standard writing, we were being consistent uh, last version, there were some pretty good requirements, the 9110 and 9120 teams came up with, but you know the 9100 was six to nine months ahead of them. We couldn't go back and bring in some of those requirements. So what you'll see is probably a lot more commonality between 9110 and 9120 than you've seen in the past. Of course, now all the standards are released, including the 9101. Now the team I just showed you is kind of the dark blue triangle up on the top. Uh, we also had sector teams that participated in this writing. Uh, I, my sector team meets at the AAQG, AAQSC meetings uh, every six months. Uh, those meetings are open, but I had a core group of about 20 to 25 people who participate in every single meeting. So overall, there was well over 100 people involved. I'm pleased to say that we had representation from regulatory authorities. Uh, we had government agencies like DCMA included in that team. We had teams from, from lower tier suppliers, uh, third, fourth tier type suppliers. We had representation from small disadvantaged businesses to make sure that the standard we came up with was appropriate and applicable for all of our stakeholders. This just shows the overall timeline where we're at today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we did start back in the 2012 timeframe with approval. Uh, this also shows how we worked with the other standards as well as the auditor training to ensure that uh, everything got released uh, approximately at the same time. Uh, the auditor training, that is uh, for certification body auditors. 
that training will be available at the end of this month. Uh, they will be required, certification by auditors will be required to take that training before they can start conducting audits to the new standard. Uh, if you as your organization uh, would like to have the same level of training for your auditors, that training is available through Plexus. So when they had the major revision to ISO in the year 2000, they came up with some quality management system principles to say, let's go first agree upon these principles and they'll build the standard to ensure that we're being consistent. Um, so one of the interesting things to do is to go look to see how much of a change is this and if, let's go look to see how the principles have changed. Okay, there were eight principles before, now there's seven. You can see there's a lot of commonality. Customer focus, once again, still the main, the main principle behind the, 91, the ISO 9001 as well as 9100. Leadership, engagement of people, you know, how do you get them, people aligned, doing the same type of thing. The process approach. The systems approach to management was kind of confusing to some people, so it has been included within the process approach. Improvement, evidence-based decision making. Once again, we want people using measures of effectiveness, KPIs, key performance indicators, to run the business and go you know, make adjustments because based upon that. And then expanding the concept from supplier relationships to relationship management which is very much in keeping with the new concept of interested parties, which we'll address here in just a minute. So let's talk about some of the key changes to ISO. First, as I mentioned, there's a new high-level structure, that's Annex SL and terminology, uh, and I have charts coming up on many of these topics. Uh, Risk-based thinking. Uh, what's interesting is that as many of you know who are currently certified, uh, we introduced risk management uh, within uh, the 2009 version in Clause 7.1, um, and we plan to go expand it in the next revision. Well, ISO has done just that. So we'll talk a little bit more about risk-based thinking, and what it does is it takes the, the requirement for preventive action that used to be at the very end of the standard, uh, which was very um, prescriptive as far as you would go do these things, and all the years I've audited the standard, I don't know of any organization that didn't have to go do the preventive action, quote unquote, to satisfy an auditor. It was not something that was intuitive, it's not the way companies operated. Now we have this concept of risk-based thinking where we have risk-based thinking throughout the entire standard. A much superior concept, uh, a much superior approach. Uh, do not take this to mean that the standard no longer wants you to be proactive and preventive in nature. Of course we do. It's always been there from the beginning. It always will be. The process approach has been strengthened even more so. Uh, and the additional focus of making sure that the quality management systems integrate with how the organization does business. Uh, to many of the small companies out there, they're probably like, well, no duh, that's nothing new. But for some of the bigger organizations, sometimes, you know, it'd be here's how the organization operates and then we do the QMS stuff over here by the quality department. And uh, the standard has now said that is not acceptable. We want everything integrated into a single approach. More of an emphasis on change management. Uh, ISO has benchmarked some other excellence type models. They saw they were a little bit weak when it came to change management. So the introduction more of change management. And finally, knowledge management. Uh, it's interesting because uh, I know in, in the industry, you just when you go to suppliers or you go to perform audits, uh, you're noticing there, there's a lot of people like myself with gray hair. Well, as people start transitioning out of the, the business, how do we go capture that knowledge 
so we have continuity of operations. Uh, many people look at this as kind of a lessons learned database, but we'll talk some more about some different tools to go use. Some more key changes from ISO. Uh, a clear understanding of the organization's context. Right up front, uh, in section four, the standard talks about the fact of how do you operate, what are your internal external issues, aligning the policy and objectives with the strategy of the organization, once again hitting that integration aspects. The new standard is more performance based than in the past. Uh, the 9100 uh, was already kind of headed that way with how we go and identify key performance indicators for uh, the results of our processes, our key processes uh, as required in 9101 and within the 9100 standard. Now ISO is putting additional emphasis that way. Greater flexibility with documentation. Uh, you may have heard that uh, there's no set requirements for a quality manual or six documented procedures. Uh, well, there is some, that is not totally true. Uh, first of all, please do not go out and have a bonfire in the parking lot saying, oh, we no longer need these. I see very, very few organizations that just have a quality manual, six documented procedures. That's one of the ways you capture knowledge, right? Is we capture knowledge in these procedures to understand here's how we go do things and do things consistently. So there is requirements within the standard, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, with regards to uh, how do we, where we have to maintain documented information for non-conforming material review as well as corrective action. Finally, more compatible with services. Many of you know that in the definition before of products, and of course we talked about products before in the standard, it said products included services. But truly, if you were to go read the standard and put the word services in there, there were some things that were just very hard to go do. And of course, ISO has not only manufacturing type companies, but service industry as well. Uh, there's restaurants, banks, I was in a horrific cab ride and I saw ISO certified on the back bumper. So there's all kinds of ISO certifications out there, not just for uh, the manufacturing industry. So let's talk a little bit about terminology and high level structure. So as I mentioned, before we talk products, now the new standard talks products and services. Before there was talk about exclusions here's what kind of the negative of here's what's excluded from my system now it talks about what's applicable now that doesn't mean necessarily that you have to go through the early part of the standard and say yep all these clauses are applicable no you can still say yeah, all the clauses are applicable with the exception of these okay documentation records document procedures uh, always a bit, people used to get into big fights about whether something was a document or a record. Now it's all called documented information. Uh, if it's something that needs to be maintained, it's a, a document or a procedure. If it's something retained, like retained document information, then it's talking about a record. That's how you, the, you can understand what type of document, uh, document information the standard is talking about. Now, does that mean that you need to go change your documents to say, wherever I have a record and a procedure, now I'm going to call it retained document information? Absolutely not. Just like probably when you had critical items in the last standard, you didn't go change your fatigue fracture critical parts. You just had kind of, probably in your quality manual, you said, hey, for these things called critical items, here's how we handle those. We call them fatigue, fracture critical, interchangeable, replaceable, IR, whatever it be. Purchase product. Now externally provided products and services, and therefore the supplier, external provider. All right, as I said, um, the document information doesn't need to be changed to incorporate the new terminology. 
I'm just trying to show you what the new terminology means. Uh, my recommendation is in your high-level document that describes your system. You just kind of say, you know, here's here's the standard verbiage or the, the standard terminology, and here's how we apply that to our business. Also, some of the questions we get is, do I need to go change? <coughs> excuse me, to the new structure. All right. There is not a requirement to go change to the new structure, but if you're going to go change your documentation, uh, the team strongly recommends that you change your documentation to your processes. Uh, I'm sure you probably have other standards that you need to be compliant with more than 9100, so let's have you be in control of your documentation structure. You determine what the structure is based upon your processes. The, uh, down at the bottom, uh, sometimes I get a question about hierarchy of definitions. So here's what it is. First, if there's a definition within the standard, obviously that's the definition to use. If it's not defined within the standard, then we use ISO 9000. Next would be the IAQG dictionary, which is kind of a combination of the standards as well as the ISO 9000. And then if it's not defined in any of those, you default to the Oxford English Dictionary. Okay. So what does this whole structure look like? Well, here it is. And it's great because it very much follows a plan, do, check, act uh, approach. So here you see, first, the plan with regards to the upfront areas of the context of the organization, leadership, planning, support, the doing, which we used to call product realization, uh, now called operation, check, the performance evaluation, how you go check to see if your system is meeting requirements, and then the act, the improvement aspect. So this much better fits. It has more of a PDCA approach to it. Uh, and it's really a, a cohesive presentation of the requirements, not necessarily a model for how you go do things. So, you know, uh, well, once again, uh, we recommend that you approach your processes based upon your interaction of processes at your particular company. Here it is with a little bit more detail. I think in my next chart, let me go peek here. Now, First, you see the plan, do, check, act. Yeah. Uh, let me go ahead and this next set of charts are a little bit easier to read than reading the little small uh, information in the boxes there. So here's the structure of the standard, just like currently, scope, references, terms and definitions. Then we have this term called context of the organization, which making sure you understand the organization is context, how it operates, what's the culture, who my competitors are, who are my customers, what's the business I'm in, what's the needs and expectations of interested parties, who are my interested parties, which of those are relevant, what's the scope of my quality management system, what's my quality management system processes look like, kind of with the interaction of processes is the way we have it today. Also within there, uh, ISO has removed the requirement for a quality manual. We have a requirement in 9100 for a high-level document that defines many of these aspects within Section 4, kind of like we have today. Section 5, leadership, leadership and commitment, policy, organization roles, responsibilities, authorities. Uh, you may remember management responsibility, so now it's more focused on leadership. Planning, actions to address risk and opportunities. Here's that risk-based thinking that we're talking about, and it's specifically tied into the planning aspects. Which are quality objectives? Uh, much more of a focus on quality objectives regarding uh, how am I going to go achieve these objectives? Who's going to be responsible? Uh, it's interesting because, of course, with NXSL, uh, ISO 14001 had a lot more details with regards to uh, 
objectives and programs than quality did. So in the merging of these documents, quality had to up their game. So uh, you'll see a little bit more details required now for objectives and then be measurable and so forth. 6.3, planning of changes. I already talked some about the fact of them upping their game and changes. Support, here's your supporting processes, resources, competence, awareness, communication, documented information. Then the operation section, the doing. Doing some planning, requirements for products and services, kind of like your contracts area, design and development, control of externally provided processes, products and services, production and service provision, release of products and services. So what do I need to go do before I release the products and services to my customer? And control of not forming outputs. My check activity, performance evaluation, includes things like my internal audit, my management review. Finally, the act, the improvement. Nonconformity, corrective action, and continual improvement. Okay? As I mentioned, there's no requirement uh, for the QMS documentation to exactly mirror that structure. But if you do want to change it, we recommend you change it to your business process, your value stream. That then resonates because you're speaking the language of your company and it sets the foundation for your future. So some of the benefits of this high-level structure and terminology is we have more commonality than we've ever had before. The plan, do, check, to act, which kind of ensures the whole continuous improvement loop is very much in place, a clear, better organization of the requirements. Here's an example of kind of a uh, business process, uh, interaction or process, not to say there's anything special about it, just wanted to show to make sure we we're communicating what a business process or interaction or process look like. So let's talk about risk-based thinking. Some people are really getting worked up about risk-based thinking. You know, hey, I have to go do FMEAs on everything. Uh, if you think about it, it's something we do almost automatically um, if you're in the business. Uh, it's always been implicit with regards to the standard. Uh, it also ensures that uh, you know, risk is considered from the beginning throughout the particular standard and kind of takes that prevention aspect and includes it within the whole standard. So implementation considerations, you know, use a risk-based approach. Uh, as we talked about before, it's very focused in the, it's with the, categorized within the planning area of the standard. So when doing planning, you know, specifically look at what the risk is, but really risk should be part of the whole quality management system. So Identify and prioritize what the risks are, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, how am I going to go address this, implement the action, check to see was I effective, and then learn. The benefits of risk-based thinking is, you know, we're trying to change the culture and mindset to be more proactive, not reactive. Uh, focus on priorities, what adds value, ensures the alignment of the resources to where I have the issues. Uh, trying to get risk thinking and knowledge permeating the organization, increases probability of reaching objectives as trying to avoid negative results. So it's not new, it's something many of you already do, it's continuous, and it's trying to make prevention just part of your everyday language. The process approach. Now, we've had the process approach being preached at us since the year 2000, so I'll go through these slides pretty quickly. Uh, I think everybody's pretty familiar with it. It's how do processes interact with one another, transforming inputs into outputs. Uh, but what's interesting is that there really wasn't much of a focus on, uh, it wasn't as much focus in the ISO world with regards to process approach as there was in aviation, space, and defense. Right, we had these pairs, we had turtle diagrams, so we were trying to push this, and now ISO is kind of catching up with where we're at with regards to uh, the process approach. The process approach, you know, you can't, 
you know, what are we going to do? Risk-based thinking, the process approach? No, it's all baked together. Um, as well as the plan, do, check, act cycle. Um, and here's, you know, kind of if you had any questions about what plan, do, check, act are, uh, I'll let you go review that on your own. Uh, the benefits of the process approach is that it increases accountability. It allows the organization to focus on their issues where they have problems, where they need to go integrate, ensures more consistent business performance, better use of resources, and improves customer confidence. You know, one of the amazing things with regard to the standard is that I've conducted audits at companies um, that had 10 locations and 27,000 employees, and I've done audits to 9,100 in a two-man machine shop. So the standard is scalable depending upon what type of business you're in, and the way it's so scalable is because of the process approach. So um, here's just a little bit more information. Uh, sometimes we get people confused about what top-level processes are versus activities, and sometimes within the standard we'll talk about things like you need to have a process for uh, configuration management. That does not necessarily mean that configuration management has to be one of your top-level processes. When you do have these top-level processes, though, the requirements of Clause 4.4 apply. And those would also be the processes that would also be part of your pairs as well, your process effectiveness assessment report. So, you know, all processes though, whether you're talking processes or uh, activities, need to be controlled uh, and we need to ensure that they're effective. So the concept of change, there's a clause on uh, the concept of change, um, and that's 6.3, but what you can also see is that there's lots of other references throughout the standard talking about change. So for example, in organizational knowledge, as your business changes, obviously what you need to maintain through your organization knowledge needs to change. Um, as I'm doing my operations previously, uh, product realization, as I have operational plan changes, both planned and unintended, how do I manage those activities? Uh, how do I ensure actions are taken with regard to the contract area and communicated within my design and development process, within my production process? So what we're trying to do, the benefits of this is trying to ensure business continuity when changes occur, considering the consequences of so my quality management system integrity is maintained. Organizational knowledge. Once again, we're trying to safeguard the organization from knowledge loss. Uh, so how do we acquire and share knowledge within the resources that we have? Um, I'll give you, uh, it's one of the ways I've seen this is that it's a lot of times when you go out and do audits, you'll see operators that have personal notes or a little notebook in their back pocket uh, or they put little scribbles all over the tools so they remember how to go drill holes. Well, if you're doing those things, you've not maintained your organizational knowledge. You should be taking that information that is necessary for the accomplishment of the job, putting it in your paperwork, putting it in your travelers, your blueprints, so everybody has the knowledge and does the work the same way. Some ways you can go do this is by lessons learned. Um, please, if you're going to go do this, uh, and I know several industries that do, software uh, does lessons learned databases, they populate them, and, but the benefit of the software teams that I see in companies is that they actually use them. Unfortunately, many companies, they'll have lessons learned databases, then they won't use them. They'll go back after a failure of a particular program and say, oh yeah, here it was in the lessons learned database. I guess we should have looked at that. So lessons learned database can be a good tool, but has to be used. Identification of experts. You know, um, using that example out on the factory floor, I don't want to go, the guy who creates all the rework, that's not the person I want to go benchmark for here's how the process works, all right? 
I want to go get my experts. How do I need to go do this and make sure that's repeatable, manufacturable? And implement succession planning as much as possible. If you're one person deep in your uh, your training matrix uh, to show you here's who's competent to do work, that's an indicator. Hey, I need to go cross train people. So the benefit is the continuity of business operations when personnel turn over. How do we go capture this knowledge and make sure that it, uh, you know, we can continue on and mitigates the impact of losing personnel. Okay, so everything I've talked to you up to now um, with regard to that last section were all changes within the ISO 9001 that are now also within AS9100. Now let me talk about some of the key changes that aviation, space, and defense have added over and above those. What we did is we kept track of not only the 9100 clauses and requirements uh, in the 2009 version, but we also kept track of all the ISO 9001, 2008 requirements. So what we did is we put this, those into the new structure uh, and also made sure that they're organized and clarified to promote understanding. So yes, uh, there were a couple of requirements that ISO 9001 deleted. We thought that uh, they should have been maintained, so we put them into 9100. Here's the list, uh, just like I did for ISO. I'll go through here through these pretty quickly. Product safety, always critical within our industry, um, especially with the ICAO uh, requirements, the International Civil Aviation Organization for safety management systems. We wanted to kind of touch on this, but without mandating a whole safety management system. We'll talk some more about that in the backup slide here in a minute. Counterfeit parts. Once again, a concern by many of our stakeholders, especially given the age of some of our products. Risk. Trying to differentiate between the new expanded ISO versus our risk management that still is within the standard. Awareness. We've always had awareness uh, topics for employees. We've expanded upon some of those. Human factors, always a requirement in, in uh, 9110, now a requirement within 9100. And configuration management, I don't think I have a slide on configuration management. Um, it's interesting because many companies uh, were confused by some of the terminology in configuration management. It kind of mirrored the ISO 10007. If you're a configuration management professional, that made a lot of sense. But uh, to just kind of a, a layperson, a small mom and pop shop, uh, what is uh, configuration identification, configuration audit, those types of terms. So what we did is we reworded it into more easy to understand language. Okay? Let's talk product safety. Product safety, obviously critical for our industry um, that we have safe products throughout the whole product life cycle. And one of the um, confusions that there's been in the past is that we just talked many times about just safety. And some people would think we were talking personnel safety instead of product safety. So one of the things we made sure of in the 2016 version of 9100 is that when we're talking about product safety, we talk product safety. We talk, we're talking about ESH type personnel safety. We, we refer to it that way. So hopefully you'll find it more, uh, more clear. Okay. Once again, the whole safety management system, SMS, is not required by 9100. It is required by the Civil Aviation. Uh, ICAO is that group that provides requirements to the FAA for flow down. Right now the FAA is developing those requirements for the fluid ads, my understanding. So the rationale is the importance of increasing safety, uh, especially to our warfighter and the flying public. Uh, also the people, or also our astronauts, also those people on the ground too. Um, also the recognition by the overall IAQG strategy 
for not only quality and on-time delivery of products, but also for safety. The definition of product safety, the state in which a product is able to perform to its designed or intended purpose without causing unacceptable risk of harm to persons or damage to property. So here are just some things that are considered. These are examples, not requirements, uh, you know, to assess the hazards and mitigations of associated risk. How many go manage my safety items? Notice safety critical items. You know, we introduced the concept of critical items to denote some items are more important than others. So obviously, if uh, you have critical items, that should be part of how you deal with product safety as well. If you're pretty low in the supply chain, uh, I make brackets. I don't even know where they even go. Obviously, this may not even be applicable to your business. Uh, but you need to go look at the requirements and make that determination. And finally, analysis and reporting of events. Uh, you want to report events such that others can learn, uh, also to analyze it so it does not recur. Also reporting within your own organization to make sure people are aware and conduct some training. In fact, here we are, communication of these events and training of personnel. So we're trying to increase the awareness of how organizations contribute to product safety, minimize the safety risk for different organizations, uh, safe, where we have safety that's integrated and embedded within the process. Uh, and I think many organizations do an excellent job with this. Uh, it, safety should not be an afterthought. It should be built in, baked into our process and also to ensure the flow down on product safety issues and criteria. Prevention of counterfeit parts. We have, uh, it's obviously a growing threat. Uh, most of the focus at this point has been on the electrical components. I will tell you that the standard does not minimize your thinking to just counterfeit parts for electronic components. Uh, it also does not mandate any of the counterfeit parts standards that uh, SAE has published. Those are good references, though, for how you might want to set up a counterfeit parts prevention program. Uh, the definition of counterfeit parts is an unauthorized copy, imitation, substitute, or modified part, material part or component, which knowingly represents, misrepresents as a specified genuine part of original or authorized manufacturer. So what's expected then is that you're going to go as an organization, go look at your, um, go look at the opportunities that you have for counterfeit parts and then put measures in place to prevent those activities. With that being said, here are some things to consider. First is training. Uh, what are those opportunities for counterfeit parts within your process? How do I go make sure that my procurement personnel, uh, you know, of course, they have incentive for trying to go to the low-cost producer? Well, guess what? Sometimes if it sounds like it's too good of a deal, it's because it is too good of a deal. To my inspection personnel, here's what to go look for with regards to counterfeit type parts. To my design personnel, how do I go make sure, you know, we have, we have electronics today where we throw things away after two years. We have aircraft that have been flying 50, 60 years. Uh, so we need to make sure we design with obsolescence management in mind. Um, let me see. Obsolescence monitoring, once again, how do I bake that in? That's now a requirement within my design, the design and development process controls for acquiring parts. How do I go get them from authorized sources? Uh, how do I make sure that I have appropriate traceability uh, for those particular parts? How do I verify and test where I might have a risk to detect the counterfeit parts? How do I report if I find some kind of a problem? How do I alert others so others can learn from this as well? Also, there's requirements within the scrap provision that uh, or you treat counterfeit parts like you do scrap. You control it 
and rendered unusable. We've had examples within our industry where we've had counterfeit parts. Uh, what does the company do? They go return it to the distributor. Well, guess what? You know, that distributor, if they're not ethical, will just turn around and go sell it to somebody else. We need to get these parts out of the supply chain, so we need to go properly control them. And that's what the last bullet is regarding not foreign material control. So the whole benefits we're trying to do is minimize the opportunity for counterfeit parts, uh, improve awareness with regards to upfront planning for obsolescence and to prevent counterfeit parts, uh, suppliers to evaluate and improve control of purchases to prevent fraud, and then how do we control counterfeit parts reentry back into the supply chain. Risk management, covered before about in clause 6.1 in the planning section, talking about risk, and that's where we're talking about risk at the planning and quality management system level. We still have risk management in clause 811, uh, the, the requirements really haven't changed since they were introduced in 2009 where you have a process to manage risk. Uh, you need to identify who's responsible, what the criteria are, how you're going to mitigate it, um, so forth, just like we have in the standard today. The benefits is that now we have not only here's how I'm going to do a mitigate risk in my operations, my product risk, but also the expanded view of risk across my whole quality management system. Awareness. We've always had awareness requirements. We have awareness of procedures. We have awareness of the quality policy. How do you contribute to objectives? We have a couple more now that have been added. Uh, first, how do employees contribute to product or service conformity? How do they contribute to product safety? and the importance of ethical behavior. So what we're looking for is when you go talk to employees, um, what do they say about how they contribute to these things? Uh, you know, hey, if I don't build it according to this blueprint, okay, uh, we could, we'll have nonconformity, customer dissatisfaction, we could have product impacts, uh, ethical behavior. Uh, I have a slide coming up on that. This, that does not necessarily mean I go set up an ethics officer. Uh, so let's see. And what we're not looking for is we want people, just like the policy, we want people, employees, to be able to internalize these things, not just uh, you know have a badge tab that talks about how they go meet these particular requirements. Uh, we want to be able to internalize uh, also, we just don't want a bunch of posters up. Once again, how do we set the culture to understand product service conformity, product safety? So talking about ethical behavior, um, how do your employees have the ability to, when things are not right, to voice their concerns? All right, they, are they limited to the chain command? Do they have an ombudsman? Do they have HR? Do you have a culture that establishes that, hey, it's okay to raise your hand? I know some companies have the ability to stop the line, kind of like some automotive companies do. Uh, that's what we're looking for here. We want management that's listening to the employees and taking actions. Uh, we don't want employees to say, oh, the guy down the line will catch that defect, or quality will go verify that problem. Um, we want people, when they find issues, to report issues, fix things. Uh, also, um, you know, sometimes these things can be very serious and even lead to criminal activities. There's laws, regulations, rules um, that need to be followed within your business. Human factors. There's Human factors kind of shows up a couple different places. Uh, what I'd like to really focus here on, though, is the human factors that are part of corrective action. Uh, sometimes when we see causal analysis for corrective action, it will say human error. Well, why was there human error? Uh, what's the next why or series of whys? 
so that's been a requirement within 9110 for a while. Now there's a requirement within 9100. There's also linkages to human factors in clause 714. That's talking about like the, uh, the environment, like work environment. Uh, obviously, you want a work environment that's conducive to producing quality products that meet customer requirements. So that can also be part of human factors. Also, in 851G, uh, there's talking about the prevention of human errors. How do I mistake-proof things as much as possible so I don't have problems? So, once again, how do I consider the human aspect of uh, the workplace, equipment, people, how do I make sure that when I do root cause analysis I consider the human aspect and then capitalize on these things for human errors, okay? And the whole benefit is how do we make more robust root cause analysis so we can put appropriate corrective actions in place so problems don't recur? So if you said, buddy, boy, you covered a lot of stuff and I really need to notify my leadership of this. You know, do you have a one-page summary of everything you said? Well, here it is. Uh, the black text is the ISO changes. The blue italics is the 9100 changes. Uh, so one page, high level. Uh, and once again, these are just the key changes, not all the changes. So implementation benefits. Um, you know. If we're serious about implementing an effective quality management system, not just about putting a piece of paper on the wall, we're going to produce continually improved safe and reliable products. We'll meet customer regulatory requirements, yielding improved customer satisfaction. The processes will be how we just do business day to day. Uh, that's what we want. Uh, I remember in the old days when we used to have a procedure for every single requirement. We had the 20 clauses. You'd go pull, of course, as you know, before we had computer records or computer procedures, you'd go pull these things, you know, and the binders would creak that had not been opened in such a long time. It's not what we want. We want procedures, processes uh, that are used, uh, that are reasonable, that meet the business requirements. The improved integration with business operations, the documentation reflects the work performed, uh, once again, uh, if you currently need documentation within your system to ensure consistency of processes, uh, please continue to use it. Don't take the you know, additional flexibility with documentation to mean I no longer need to have that. Focus on the complete supply chain and stakeholders. Um, one of the things you'll see is that uh, where you have the net, where you have risk, uh, the standard now requires you to go to sub-tier suppliers. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next webinar. Fewer customer unique documents. The more we can try to go put within the standard as industry, the fewer times you'll have customer unique requirements, which may force you to go do things differently. And the standard is still very much recognized by regulatory authorities. Uh, as I said, they even participate in the writing team. So the transition summary, um, it starts off with September 2015, that's when ISO 9001 2015 was released. Um, I think you'll see there in September the 9100 was released in all three sectors. Uh, the decision was made uh, that instead of releasing the standard in the Americas uh, in May that we would act as an international body and would release the standards all together worldwide simultaneously. So that's what happened in September. Uh, the 9101, 9110, 9120 has been published now. Uh, at the end of this month, the mandated aerospace order transition training will be available. There's also going to be uh, a transition to OASIS Next Generation uh, project. Uh, many of you know that we use OASIS to go capture our information. Uh, June of next year, all future audits will be to the new standard. So many people are kind of getting 
excited about that, and I can understand that. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to ensure that we work to the September 2018 deadline that ISO has imposed. Otherwise, what's going to happen is suppliers, organizations, you all, will need to have a two-part implementation. One, you'll need to have your CB, um, Perry Johnson in this case, come out and do a transition audit to ISO 9001, and then come back and go do another transition audit to 9100. Well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so what we did is we aligned ourselves for one transition period to be consistent with ISO 9001. So in September 2018, the 2009 certificates will no longer be valid. So in order to back up and have time to go conduct those audits, all audits after June of next year have to be to the new standard. And by the way, with that being said, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can, can you can transition during uh, sort of was it recertification audits or surveillance audits. So I mentioned earlier on at the very beginning. Some people may not have been on the line yet, but hey, buddy, that's pretty good charts. Where can I go get those? Uh, the 9100 team developed deployment support material that are all available on the IAQG website at www.iaqg.org. On the left side of the screen, if you go hit that, you'll see it says Deployment Support Materials. You click there. There's also a yellow button in the top right. You can click that and go directly there too. And then you will see all the standards we have. That's on the right side of the screen. And you'll see the ones with hot links where we have deployment support materials. That's where the two points to. So you'd point, you click on 9100. So once again, that's www.iaqg.org. And this is what it gives you. Um, it gives you a little bit of a synopsis paragraph and then actually says, here's some deployment support material. Um, and you'll see key changes presentation. That is what I just went over here in the last hour with you. Uh, actually, uh, there's been some additional content that's been added, uh, an executive presentation, which takes some of these charts and uh, has a kind for a higher level. Uh, many of you may have seen that there's also a two-hour presentation. Uh, I'll be going through the clause-by-clause -clause presentation during that particular uh, presentation. Uh, you can talk to uh, Perry Johnson or go look uh, the Perry Johnson website for when that presentation will be. And what that's going to be is it kind of doesn't include the introductory type stuff, um, high level overview. It's two hours going clause by clause into the changes. Um, next you'll see their correlation matrix. Uh, we have it both in Word side by side as well as a table in Excel. So if you want to go check to see where did the requirement from 2009 go to, and where is it currently in 2016 or 2016 to 2009 version, this correlation matrix will show you that. Uh, there's some FAQs. Uh, what you'll also see out there is, and I'll probably be populating it uh, either today or tomorrow, sending it to SAE for posting, is I have a gap assessment worksheet that I'll be putting out here. And what it does is it shows here it is clause by clause, how it relates to the 2009, and then provides kind of like a worksheet for you to go analyze your, your deltas and so forth and what actions are you going to go take. Okay. So we're just about at the end of the hour. Uh, as I said when we first got started, Everybody is muted, so you cannot ask questions, uh, but I would encourage you to go to the question uh, under go to webinar control panel, uh, and Perry Johnson will send me your questions, and I will respond. Uh, I wish you lots of success in your trans transition to the new standard. I appreciate you being on this webinar, and uh, thank you for being part of the aviation space and defense industry. Have a great day.